Welcome to Extension Connection on Super Talk 1270. Thoughtful information and discussion with experts from both Burley and Morton County Extension Service offices. Extension Connection provides advice on family nutrition, issues in agriculture, lawn and garden, community leadership, homeowner concerns, and so much more. Live from the Super Talk 1270 studio, this is Extension Connection. Good morning and welcome to the Extension Connection. This is the Morton County Extension office here visiting with you today. And this is Vanessa Hoynes and I'm joined by Renee Tokash. And I think later we'll be having uh, Jackie and Carla will also be joining us. So stay tuned for those, uh, those voices joining us later. Well, Renee, Renee's been our intern for a few weeks now. Anything you want to share with the, with the audience? Um, it's been an interesting internship. Uh, it's a lot of new stuff every day. It's not really the same thing any of the days. Um, anything can really happen on a day-to-day -day basis that changes the whole plan. Um, there's a lot of meetings to attend, which I've been going to a lot, but that's a part of the internship and learning how to do extension work. Well, good deal, good deal. And I think it's been kind of fun. Um, you've had a chance to kind of revisit some of your old stomping grounds with uh, going to some of the 4-H events and helping out with consumer choices and um, those kinds of things, which are, I think, are near and dear uh, th to your heart, too. Oh, yes. So that's kind of fun. Well, I know we really appreciate you having you a, a team member in our office and, and look forward to you helping us out with more things and, and doing more, more projects. Um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, today of July is actually National Picnic Month. And I think that makes, uh, makes some good sense as we look at the 4th of July coming up. I also thought I'd talk a little bit about some tips on grilling. I'm guessing that there are going to be lots of grills heating up in the next few days and probably for the rest of the summer um, as we look at the, the nice weather that we're going to have for the holiday season. And then that also leads us to maybe some tips about playing out in the sun, which I'm, I'm sure, again, we'll be doing a lot of that in the next coming days. So starting out with picnic month, um, this is an opportunity to get outside and enjoy those foods um, that we sometimes um, like to hover inside and let's get outside and enjoy some fresh air and have a picnic outside with that. So a couple things to keep in mind is to make sure that you think about going green. Um, having a picnic is an opportunity um, sometimes to add some more of those greens and other fruits and vegetables to your, to your menu. Um, maybe you want to toss a salad or to add to wh whatever you're eating or cut up some vegetables and fruit. That can be a healthier choice than, than just grabbing that bag of chips that we might grab and stick in our, in our picnic basket. Also going lean, uh, making sure that we're trimming, that we're choosing lean meats if we're planning to grill or um, other meats that we might choose for our sandwiches when we're having a picnic um, so that we, we have those healthier choices along with that. And then also um, you can also make over some of your recipes. Maybe some of your salads could use a looking at to see if that there are some things you could trim. Some of our sauces for our salads can be very high in calories. Also, with whole foods, when we're picnicking, you might be tempted to turn to some of those prepackaged or convenience foods rather than choosing whole foods. And um, you can really save calories and provide more nutrients to your family if you're choosing um, whole fruits and vegetables uh, rather than things that are already prepared or processed and, and partially ready to go for you. And then probably most importantly, we need to make sure we have safe foods. Uh, when we have, whenever we're serving food outside, we always have to make sure that we're keeping those hot foods hot and cold foods cold. Um, hot foods need to be above 140 and cold foods need to be below 40 in order to keep them safe. And um, a rule of thumb is that when foods are out of the cooler or out of refrigeration, uh, two hours is our limit. And then, of course, looking at the or listening to the weatherman, if we have those days that are above 90 and we're having our picnic, then foods can only be out, out of that cooler for an hour. So we need to make sure that um, if, we, if we are having a picnic in those hot weather days, we need to make sure that we serve the food and then really get it right back into the cooler. Otherwise, we're going to have to um, throw it away and not be able to use it. And that's always a, a sad thing. 
And then the last thing we need to keep uh, keep an eye on is clean, making sure that we clean our picnic spot both before and and uh, after we have our picnic. Always checking to make sure that you have clean water there or bring water in order to um, either both to drink and also to use in that process. And then extinguish, extinguish that campfire uh, if you have started one to make sure that we don't start any fires after you've had your wonderful picnic. Some food, uh, fun food tip ideas for picnics that I found that might be kind of some fun things you could bring along for a picnic would be to cut um, triangle shaped wedges of watermelon and then um, puncture the bottom with a stick in through the rind and make it look like a popsicle for the kids can be a fun way for them to have a healthy snack. Or also making, I think we're, we're familiar with kebabs when we think about putting kebabs on the grill. But how about a sandwich kebab? You can have use small pieces of bread, cheese, perhaps grapes or tomatoes, um, some chunks of sandwich meat, and maybe some olives. And the kids could even create their own sandwich kebab if you wanted to. And that can be a fun way to, um, to serve that sandwich rather than the old run-of-the-mill cut it into four corners kind of thing. Or how about a fruit caterpillar? Place purple and red grapes alternately on skewers. And again, that can be something that can be fun to eat as well as healthy. Another refreshing treat could be taking ice cream cones and filling them with melon balls. Again, a fun, uh, fun way to serve that and a fun way to eat it in addition. Or try some crunchy vegetable flowers taking a cucumber and cutting a, a V-shaped wedge, uh, the length of the, of the cucumber, and doing that on four in, in four individual spots so that when you slice the cucumber, you end up with f flower petals rather than the, the regular circle um, piece that you would cut from a cucumber. And you can also try some banana sushi. Spread a whole grain tortilla with peanut butter, sun butter, or other spread, and then place a banana inside and roll and cut it into slices. This can be a nice refreshing snack for, for your kids, for other kids, um, or for big kids. That might go. Another kid favorite can be, of course, making those dessert, those dirt desserts using a healthy pudding and then adding some of those gummies with some crumblings of chocolate cookie crumbs on top. So those are some things that we can keep in mind during July being our picnic month. And we um, will also be talking about grilling a little bit later and the safety things to be concerned and to be aware of when you, when you think about grilling. And so with that, we are going to take a break and we'll be right back with the Extension Connection. Currently, it's 68. Get the traffic and weather information you need anytime on Super Talk 1270 and online at supertalk1270.com. And we're back with the Extension Connection. This is the Morton County Extension Office. Uh, Vanessa Hoynes, and I'm joined by Jackie Buckley, Renee Tokash, and Carla Mickle. Um, we were just talking about July being picnic, National Picnic Month, and uh, perhaps we'll talk a little bit more about grilling later. But while I have you listening, I also wanted to mention that if you need a meat thermometer and are looking for one, if you stop by the Extension Office in Morton County, either today or tomorrow, we will get you hooked up with a meat thermometer that you can use over the 4th of July. So, and at the same time, you, you're welcome to pick up other grilling um, information and tips and tricks for your big grilling weekend. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jackie. Good morning, everybody. Um, Renee, you have a bison shirt on today. That is so awesome. It's my first bison <laughs> shirt. <laughs> I just looked up and I saw it. Yeah, Renee's been going to school at um, Kansas that State, other that other school down south, and I'm we're happy to announce that she's going to transfer back to Nor back to North Dakota State um, this fall and work on her egg education degree, which is great. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about a news bit that came across on one of the blogs I subscribe to, and it's about Costco and HSUS. Um, and the quote at the beginning is, is, an appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile, hoping it will eat him last. Um, this, uh, this is what a, a blogger wrote. Um, and so this is something that Costco is considering or working with. 
In February 2007, Costco declared its intent to transition to all cage-free eggs. At that time, HSUS was Costco's biggest fan, declaring the announcement a victory after a two-year campaign and applauding the move. Costco apparently didn't move fast enough for HSUS. HUS is liking, and they are back to bully the brand again. On June 9th, um, about two, three weeks ago, HSUS released a footage shot from a Pennsylvania egg farm that supplies eggs to Costco and other large retailers. The main thrust of HSUS's campaign is that the farm still uses cages to house laying hens. HS HSUS <laughs> claims that the, this is somehow misleading to Costco shoppers, even though cage-free appears nowhere on the eggs packaging. <laughs> And Costco recognized up front its 2007 announcement that supplying cage-free eggs was going to be a sourcing challenge and they would need to complete the change. Um, the most interesting part to, to this blogger is, is Costco, Costco, it's time to go cage-free campaign is this landing page. The page includes a form for visitors to submit their email address, phone number, and zip code. Once receiving the information, an HSUS representative will call the number, giving talking points about the issue, and connect the caller with Costco customer service. It's telling that telling that HSUS's followers apparently aren't interested enough in the issue to look up a number and dial the phone themselves. Um, Costco has kept pretty mum about the campaign until yesterday when it quietly posted a response on its customer service page and began responding to posts on social media. This time, Costco chose not to appease HSUS, which is great news. Um, rather than accepting HSUS's positions on animal welfare as fact, the response acknowledges vigorous debates about animal welfare and laying hens and that some advocate advocate, excuse me, that cages are safer for the hens. The response goes on to point that consumers have choices at the grocery store and are free to purchase a variety of cage-free and organic options that Costco offers. Um, the blogger states that she's pleased and relieved to see a large retailer stand up for science and consumer choice rather than to bend the demands of activist groups. Hopefully other companies will learn from Costco's experience that appeasing the activists will not make them go away. They will be back to continue to, to damage brands. Today it's cage-free. Tomorrow it could be range-free. The next day it might be something else. It's important to realize that no production system will satisfy groups with the ultimate goal of eliminating meat consumption. Okay, and so this blogger says, now I will be out to join her nearest Costco. And so that's something that's really good news that Costco didn't let HSUS bully them into um, thinking that they had to have all cage-free hens, I mean, excuse me, cage-free eggs on their on their shelves. And so um, mm -hmm. that's that's really a, a good um, good deal. Um, Renee, um, I gave you a little piece about pink eye and cattle. Would you like to discuss that? Yes, um, we'll be talking about how to prevent and treat pink eye and cattle and some tips to control the flies. So pink eye is a painful cattle disease that can cause reductions in weaning weights as much as 17 to 65 pounds per animal. And once pink eye begins to spread, it's very difficult to contain and control. So face flies play an important role in the spread of pink eye as an irritated eye produces excessive tearing that attracts pests. And then these face flies pick up the causative agent of pink eye and then transfer it to other animals in your herd. In comparison to horn flies, face flies actually spend little time on the animal. So one face fly can spread pink eye to several animals within the same day, which is why it's important to be aggressive about pink eye control as soon as signs are seen that it is in your herd. In most situations, the first step in getting control is to control the flies. And there are several options for that, including fly tags, porons, sprays, dust bags, and back rubbers. So some tips on how to control flies. Um, you can't always eliminate the fly problems, but you can lessen their negative impact. Flag ties, or fly tags, excuse me. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> perform best when administered at the proper time. Unfortunately, this means cattle might have to be brought in specifically 
for administering fly tags um, as spring branding, castrating, dehorning, and vaccinating are frequently completed prior to the optimal time for fly tag administration. Thus, these tags are often administrated as much as 60 days prior to fly season, which can hurt the tag's efficiency. And fly taking cows is usually more effective than taking the calves, but taking both is probably the best uh, scenario that you can choose. There are also several pink eye vaccinations that can help. You should consult your local veterinarian about the timing of these vaccinations and which vaccine to use in your area. Many of these vaccines require a booster dose for greater efficiency, which could actually work uh, to your advantage. Since calves must be brought in for a second dose, fly tags can be administered at a time closer to the start of fly season. So finally, to treat pink eye, the key to treatment is to catch the disease early on. Generally, a long-acting oxytetracycline antibiotic is very effective, but resistance isn't uncommon. In this case, your local veterinarian may need to conduct a culture, culture and test to determine which antibiotic the bacteria is sensitive. Another key component to treating pink eye is protecting the eye from light, which is just as important as an antibiotic. Because ultraviolet rays can activate en enzymes that can cause more damage to the eye when the eye is infected. Eye patches are very effective in protecting the eyes from sunlight, but the challenge is keeping the eye patch on the animal. <laughs> there are some eye patches um, that are out there, such as a constructive adhesive, um, such as liquid nails, but consulting your veterinarian um, is the best option to determine what product will keep the eyelid shut to protect the eye from sun. Another thing is pasture management. Um, this is important for pink eye control. Grass that is headed out can irritate eyes, causing them to tear and thus attracting face flies, and keeping pastures trimmed can reduce this irritation. Again, the best way to deal with pink eye is to get ahead of it and stay ahead of it. Do this by using a broad-based approach, with inclu which includes fly control, vaccination, and pasture management. Make sure to consult your local veterinarian to develop a program that is tailored to your operation and therefore preventing any pink eye um, in any of your herd. Instead of an eye patch, can you put sunglasses on it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think cattle would like that very much. They'd, they sure look cool, <laughs> though. <laughs> you know, the coolest herd in the, in the range. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and Renee comes from a, a registered Angus operation here in Morton County, and I don't know if they've had any issues with pink eye. I know that a year ago um, we had a very bad infestation of pink, pink eye in many of our herds in Morton County and I guess all over the state along with foot rot. And so um, we want to make sure that you're aware of some things that you can do. Um, in our crop and pest report, we get that weekly. They have a little snippet that calls it the good bug corner. And this week's good bug corner, good bug corner featured <laughs> Say insect, that three times fast. Yes, I know, I can't. Is the spined soldier bug. It's... um or it's in the family of the stink bug. As the name implies, they will emit a strong odor when disturbed as a defensive mechanism. Spined shoulder bugs are brown to tan, about eight and a half to 13 millimeters long, and they can be identified by their protruding spurs on the prothorax behind the head. This insect is an excellent predator on many insect pests of potatoes, beans, corn, and other crops. It prefers to feed on larvae of the European corn borer, diamondback moth, fall armyworm, cabbage looper, imported cabbage worm, Colorado potato beetle, velvet bean caterpillar, and flea beetles. In potato fields, spined soldier bugs in combination with two spotted stink bugs can reduce infestations of Colorado potato beetles by 50%. Individual spine shoulder bugs have been observed to eat about 100 late in star fall, fall armyworm larvae over the season. Boy, they're hungry bugs. <laughs> That's a lot to eat. Um, we're getting the cue from Jim that we're about to go to our break, and we'll be back with Carla, Vanessa, and Renee, and myself after the break. Currently, it's 68. Get the app called Radio Pup for your iPhone. 
and take us everywhere you go. Bismarck and Mandan's own Super Talk 1270. Welcome back to the Extension Connection, and we were just chatting about 4-H Camp, yeah. and Carla's doing some landscaping up there with the grant money that we got, and yeah. so um, if Jim got turned us on before we were ready, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. Yeah. Um, and so, Carla, do you want to discuss a little bit? I see you have the State Fair book I out. I do, I do. I touch base again on camp, though. Um, I haven't been up there for a few weeks, and they've got um, the lay poles up in the parking lot, and the one out by the... Um, the new John's Root Center, and um, the John's Root Center is completely sided now, and um, a lot of big changes in the last few weeks. It looks really different. So um, a lot of kids up at camp this week. There's a horse camp and then an adventure camp, probably about 50 kids. Okay. And I know next week is a very small camp, and the week after they are full, survivor camp and adventure camp that week. So um, another full week of camp. But, um, yeah, the State Fair is coming up, and um, – Opportunity to visit with everyone about some um, 4-H events that are going on at the State Fair. Uh, we won't be back until um, the 15th of July um, as Morton County here on the radio. And so, um, and that is actually day Renee and I will be up judging projects. Vanessa's gone and so is Jackie for work other places. So um, touch base here with some 4-H. 4-H um, deadline for exhibits for Morton County for the State Fair is on July 9th. Um, so if any 4-Hers are listening out there, I know no one's got school, everyone's listening to us on the radio, um, then uh, your 4-H projects, with the exception of any perishables, so fresh flowers, um, any food that you're going to be sending up to the fair, um, any crops or vegetables, um, those need to be in the office on July 14th by 9 a.m. All your other projects need to be turned in by July 9th. That's a Thursday, and that gives us time in the office to get everything tagged and boxed up so we can determine also what kind of vehicles we need to take up to my not because we've been taking a trailer the last few years and i know there's some big stuff going up so um on wednesday july 15th renee and i will be headed up to the state fair to help judge all the 4-h static exhibits and for those of you who have seen the judging of the those static exhibits at the county fair a lot different process at the state fair um, we don't have the opportunity to visit with the 4-hr one-on-one -on -one. And so um, it's really kind of going into it um, blind and checking out what is on their tag, how old they are, how many years they've been in that project, and then really comparing that project then to other projects that we see um, that have been brought to the North Dakota State Fair from across the state. And so um, really unique opportunity. We can provide feedback on um, some feedback tags and um, hopefully the kids can get an idea of what we were thinking when we judged their project. And then... Um, those projects then will be open for viewing when the fair starts on Friday, July 17th. And um, the 17th, again, is when the state fair opens. And then on Sunday, um, I'm taking out all the poultry information because, of course, the poultry show at the state fair has been canceled. Um, but horses start coming in on Sunday. And um, there's also a film festival in the Norse Room of the State Fair Center. It's a great opportunity to take in some um, films that were made by 4-Hers from across the state. Those winners have the opportunity to attend the national event, which is, has been in Missouri um, the last couple of years. And I know Linda Hauge, who is now gone, she's retired from the Center for 4-H, such a bummer, um, has been active in taking those folks um, down to Missouri. Um, the, after the film festival, and we really roll out the red carpet for that. I mean, it's a red carpet kind of Emmy-looking event. It's pretty neat. Um, right after that, we have the Communication Arts Contest, and that is in the upper atrium of the State Fair Center. On Monday, we start the 4-H Horse Show, um, a lot of different events. The 4-H Project Expo is also that day, the clothing review, and that kind of wraps up Monday. Um, Tuesday, we have the Horse Show, um, continues for 4-H, and then the Beef, the Sheep, the Swine, the Dairy, Goats, and the Junior Sheep Show, they um, start checking in on Tuesday. Um, gets pretty busy in the Livestock Expo Barn. Um, registration for Consumer Choices is that morning from 10 until 11 at the State Fair Center in the upper atrium. And the contest for Consumer Choices, which Morton County does have a team, um, is on, we have two teams, a junior team and a senior team. So, and um, they, I think they have a workout this afternoon. They Yay, they're getting ready for the State Fair. Um, that contest actually starts at 11 o'clock. Um, we have awards then, generally around 4, I believe. And then that evening we enjoy a 4-H an FFA exhibitors picnic, um, which is always fun. You get to see 4-Hers and folks that we work with from all across the state. Um, 
swine check-in and weigh-in is Tuesday afternoon and the sheep and goat market animals weigh-in. And then we have penning of check-in and penning of the rabbits. <laughs> We're going to pen the rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, weigh-in of the 4-H beef market animals, which I know can also be a very busy time up at the state fair. Um, Wednesday, we continue the 4-H and FFA horse show. And then the junior steer and heifer point show um, starts in the all seasons arena and that's at eight o'clock and generally that's quite a few participants right Jackie mm -hmm. okay yep. yep and there is junior show which 4-H and FFA members do participate in okay. and then we have 4-H swine show at eight o'clock the livestock expo barn at eleven thirty, the rabbit show and one o'clock the sheep show starts and that kind of wraps up the day there's nothing else going on that afternoon um, but those events take quite a while and so if you're up in that area please stop by and visit with these folks um, they put a lot of time in with their animals and um, would be happy to answer any questions you have um, about 4-H or about their animals on Thursday the 23rd we have the 4-H beef show and that is again at the all seasons arena and then there is um, a goat meeting um, at two o'clock in the afternoon so they get ready for the goat show on the following day which is Friday July 24th um, the dairy goat show the meat goat show is in the goat barn arena and then the 4-h dairy show which we have quite a few dairy animals that come from Morton County um, will be in the expo barn East arena on Friday July 24th um, the big event for the week is of course the 4-h round robin showmanship event um, that event is held in the Livestock Expo building, which is the main arena of the Livestock Expo building. And um, that is where all the kids really compete, um, those that have won in the showmanship divisions in their, each of their classes, and um, they'll be competing in that. And then that evening is the release of all static exhibits in the Livestock. They get to go home. And then um, Sunday, I know we'll pick up some exhibits on Sunday, but um, for the most part, that kind of wraps up the 4-H events. There's a lot of other things to in take in at the North Dakota State Fair, but the 4-H events, um, those I just um, pretty much highlighted. So, um, But if you have any questions about the State Fair or events going on with the 4-H program, um, please don't hesitate to call our office, 667-3340. And in the past, um, we've had a really good representation just from Morton County with all of our animals um, whether it be goats or swine or beef um, or dairy, um, we've had a really good showing. So a lot of pride in the kids here um, that take projects up and a lot of work that goes into it. So I'm looking forward to a really great week. So we also have anything to add on the state fair, except for it's coming up really fast. It's coming up too fast. <laughs> Way yeah, too fast. Because then we know that our fair is just yeah. around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> summer's almost gone. I yes, know. yes. It's, yeah, summer goes by really fast after the state fair is over with. Yep. And we've been working on um, county fair stuff. Carrie is just on the ball this year and getting all kinds of stuff done for the county fair and um, lining up judges. So anyone who's listening interested in being a, a judge for static exhibits and you have a specialty maybe in a craft or um, uh, food, we are looking for food judges. Um, so if you um, have a knack for cooking or baking and you would be interested in being a judge, please call me, 667-3340. Um, um, I'm not afraid to do cold calling. I call out to the bank all the time in New Salem and say, do you ladies know anybody who can help me out with foods? And they usually give me a, a nice list of um, names for um, sewing projects and um, crafts and uh, um, all kinds of things. So photography. I know I've gotten some photography judges from them as well. So um, the other thing I have to visit about is I had the opportunity last week to attend the National 4-H Shooting Sports Championships down in Grand Island, Nebraska. North Dakota took three teams. We had a shotgun team represented by Ramsey County. We had an air rifle team represented by Cass and Richland County. I almost forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. I spent a whole week with them. I forget. And then our archery team from North Dakota was represented by Emmons County. And um, great showing by North Dakota. Um, not one of our, our count or our um, participants um, came in last. Um, you know, they were all um, up um, pretty high, I would say. Our tree team finished 16th overall. They had a great showing. Um, air rifle team, um, they finished 19th overall. And the shotgun team, they were actually on the medal stand on um, the Friday. Um, they received fifth place overall um, for the whole event. And then the trap team um, that was part of the shotgun team actually finished in third. So those gentlemen got a ribbon and a medal. And um, just what a unique opportunity. Um, 632 participants from 33 states and um, just a great group of people. And 
personally, it was um, an opportunity for me to learn from others and bring back some great information, and everyone was very helpful. And also those that represented North Dakota, great group of young men, and their parents were wonderful to work with. And um, I just wanted to thank everyone and congratulate everyone for um, their placings at Nationals, and um, look forward to another great year next year. So with that, Jim gave us the cue for a break, and we will be back here shortly. Currently, it's 70. Sean Hannity, weekdays at 2, only on Super Talk 1270. Welcome back to the Extension Connection. This is Jackie Buckley and the rest of the Morton County staff, Vanessa, Carla, and Renee. We're here today live in the studio. And so if you're interested in making any calls, um, you can call us at 663-1270, and we'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. And like Carla said, if you know don't know our number at the office, it's 667-3340, and we'll be glad to answer any questions there as well. Um, I just have a, another little snippet of information. Um, many of you that are out maybe weeding your gardens and then also um, out in your crop fields, there is a weed that is edible. One person's weed is another person's ingredient for a salad. Mm -hmm. And um, there's an area, I mean, there is a weed. It's called lamb's quarters. It's a member of the goose fit foot family. It's a relative of spinach, quinoa, and beets. Um, stems, leaves, and seeds can be used as a source of food. Lamb's quarters leaves are used in the kitchen as a wild spinach substitute, added to salads, stir-fry, soups, and casseroles. Dried leaves make flour and are mixed with water to make a tortilla. Lamb's quarters is the second highest in nutrition of all wild foods. Amaranth is the, the number one um, supplier of nutrition. And they are both. They are also both rich in beta carotene, vitamin B2, niacin, calcium, iron, and phosphorus. There are a few few precautions, however. Perhaps with green plants and with all green plants in general, lamb's quarters can absorb nitrate from contaminated soil. So be careful when you harvest this plant. Avoid too much raw consumption of the plant, as it contains oxalic acid. And we talked about that earlier when we were talking about the rhubarb situation when we had frost. Um, cooking will destroy some of the oxalic acid, but for salad and smoothies, use lemon juice to neutralize the acid. Seeds of lamb's quarters can be dried and sprouted or ground into flour for bread, pancakes, muffins, cakes, and cookies. The seeds are also used as a seasoning and sometimes as a coffee substitute. Um, and if you don't know what lamb's quarters looks like, um, it's a greenish gray plant. And then as you look at it or looking down on it, you will see specks of white in that plant um, on the leaves. And so that's how you um, kind of identify it. And so if you have... And they're fuzzy. Yes. And they're kind of fuzzy. <laughs> yes. They have... They're a little hairy. Uh, <laughs> so they tickle when they go down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, We've been, and I've been seeing the airplanes flying a lot um, out of the Mandan Airport, and I know that the aerial applicator out of Hebron has been busy too. Um, the central, south central part of the state and southwest part of North Dakota um, are very, are showing to be very high in scab. Uh, majority of the state has received rainfall during the last week or so, specifically areas south of I-94. And this has really elevated the scab risk. According to the <coughs> excuse me, National Fusarium Head Blood Prediction Model, scab risk is the highest in south central to southwest North Dakota. And then areas between the Red River Valley and Carrington from Grand Forks to the South Dakota border. The NDSU model indicates a moderate risk of scab developing in, on susceptible varieties throughout most of the state and areas of high scab risk along the southern edge of North Dakota. 
Remember, no wheat variety is immune to scab and timely fungicide applications need to be considered in areas of elevated risk. And so you can go to the Endon site at NDSU and look up to see where the, what the scab risk model might say. Um, I was on it yes, uh, earlier this week and um, Mandan was in the very, it was in the red category, which means it's very high. Um, maybe with some of these higher temperatures, we will be able to get rid of um, some of that as well. We've been noticing a lot of lodging in small grains and lodging results from a combination of a number of factors and you is usually induced by strong winds. Lodging is most common in the latter part of the crop's growth, particularly during grain filling as more of the plant's weight is shifted to the upper portion of the plant. The main factors that predispose a crop to lodging are high levels of nitrogen. Nitrogen causes lush growth and heavier plant tissue. Excessive nitrogen can cause stems to be weak. High seeding rates. With high plant densities, there is less space for roots of individual plants. Therefore, root systems are usually less extensive and less well anchored. Wet soil conditions. Excessive soil moisture limits root development. Furthermore, roots in these types of soils often suffer from root rot. Wet soils do not anchor the roots of a plant as tightly as a dry soil. Tall plant types or varieties with poor straw strength. Taller plant types or are more prone to lodging as their center of resistant to lodging. Within all plant height types, however, there is variability for lodging resistance and some varieties are just more prone to lodging than others. Although modern breeding programs screen their materials for lodging resistance, that does not mean that they will all have the same level of lodging resistance, nor does it mean that you can manage them poorly and expect them to remain standing. And so lodging is a concern um, in many of our crops. And I think the wet temperatures, wet um, conditions that we've had is especially true this year. And there's not a lot of root development because the roots haven't had to go very deep into the soil structure mm -hmm. because of all the rain that we've been getting. Um, and Vanessa, um, you were gonna maybe talk a little bit more about, a little bit about grilling and maybe about your thermometers that you're giving out. Yeah, um, I wanted to share a couple, just a couple things that we have available in the office if you wanna stop by and get some, some additional information. But definitely uh, today and tomorrow is your chance to stop by and get a meat thermometer. Um, just stop by the courthouse. We're on the first floor as you come in the door. And then we also have some materials. Um, specifically, I have some uh, a great publication from the North Dakota Beef Commission that talks about all the different um, ways that we can cook beef. And it's a great resource because it does include grilling. Um, and so when you're looking, when you get to the meat counter and you're not sure what you should be picking and you want to grill something, uh, gives you some good tips. You know, looking at strip steak or a flank or a ribeye would be some good choices if you're wanting to grill specifically. And then it walks you through some some ways to uh, ensure that you get a good uh, a good end product when you're when you're done and wanting to serve that beef to to your family and friends this weekend. When you pick up the meat thermometer, you'll also have some information there about making sure that if you are cooking burgers, for example, or any kind of ground meat, you meet, need to make sure that it reach, reaches 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is um, putting the thermometer to, into the center, um, actually sideways through the, through the meat patty to make sure that you are getting to the internal temperature of that. We can really no longer look at just whether the um, juices run clear or if it's not pink because some um, some meats will actually will will turn brown prematurely before it reaches that temperature. And then sometimes ground meats will actually not ever turn brown. And so uh, using a meat thermometer really in, ensures that it's safe and also ensures that you're not overcooking your food because I think without it, we have a tendency to overcook rather than undercook. And then if you're cooking, if you're grilling beef, pork, veal, or lamb, steaks and roasts and chops, those kinds of things on the grill. 145 degrees is the internal temperature that we recommend for medium rare. Um, and then if you want it more medium, about 160. And so again, stop by the office today or tomorrow to receive a uh, free 
meat thermometer that you can use this weekend um, for all those great grilling opportunities that you'll have with friends and family over the 4th of July. Yes, and we're hoping that everybody will have a very safe and happy 4th of July. Definitely. Um, my husband and I are headed to Medora um, to spend some mm -hmm. time in Medora and um, you know, with the camper and to get to go to the musical, so we're excited about that. Yeah, that's always a nice nice way to get away for the 4th of July. But, yeah, we have parade and all those fun things. Make sure everybody uses their sunscreen, um, making sure you're checking uh, not to be out during, if you are going to be out during those high exposure times between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., making sure that you're using uh, a sunscreen that's at least uh, an SPF of 30 and higher, and then make sure you're reapplying that every every two hours again. So it'll take a couple applications if you're going to the parade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or make sure you wear a big floppy hat or some have some clothing that you can use to put over the top if you're if you're getting a little bit more sun than than you want um, and I think just everybody to keep in mind that it there is no tan that is a safe tan um, all tan indicates that your skin has been damaged that's how it tans yes. and so you look healthy when you're nice and white and pasty. <laughs> no, you don't. I don't like being white and pasty. I'm sorry, Vanessa. <laughs> no, I know. Be sorry. I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> no, no. But um, making sure you're protecting yourself from the sun is a good idea. Yeah. Especially those little ones out there. Okay. And so we will um, we'll be talking about probably the Morton County Fair some more when we um, continue our uh, extension connection the next time we're on. And... Um, we're just doing some wrap-up things here, and um, I guess um, I, I was going to let producers know that alfalfa weevil, the time for serious injury and probably heaviest feeding, has, has passed. And so um, we can get that alfalfa off as, as quickly as possible, and I know that people are really um, trying to get hay off because... And it keeps raining, which is, you know, kind of a depressing thought for the beef producers out there that are trying to um, to do that. And based on the accumulated growing degree days, most North Dakota is past or at peak feeding time for alfalfa weevil when the larvae are in the third to fourth instars. Alfalfa has been cut, um, and so we're, we're working on that. And Jim has given us the cue. We only have a few seconds left. So happy 4th of July, everybody.